position says bananas. So many bananas. All bananas the bananas. And pajamas. Bananas and pajamas. It is time for the This Week in Science podcast live broadcast. And we are here once again to do this thing that we call science podcasting. And um, yeah, like I say, every episode, this is live. There will be an edited version that will go out as the podcast. We all good, team? Uh, team good. Team go. Everybody's ready. Blair is podcasting from a secret location. Yes. <laughs> not the first time. Secret not location that is time. not my living room. That's all. <laughs> Not the living room, not the normal. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Are you ready for another show? We're here. I'm standing up. I decided that I was going to find a way to stand up. And so I like my chair, but I don't think I need that discomfort. So um, are we going to do this? Yes. Make this go live? Hello, Carol Ann, one grouchy gamer. We're doing it. So going live in a three- a two. This is Twist. This week in science, episode number eight hundred four, recorded on Wednesday, December sixteenth, twenty twenty. Twist the season to hibernate. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show we will fill your head with sparkles, specks, and faces. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Seeking knowledge is a natural, ingrained human trait. The availability and access to information these days is unlike any other time in history. But seekers of knowledge must be wary, for not all information is knowledge. And too often, information is used to mislead intentionally, willfully, and with purpose. This practice is an ancient one. Greenland isn't green. It got that name from a Viking who was trying to get more people to join his icy settlement that ended up badly. Every religion you can think of tried to point to the one that is evidence-based. One that, in the light of scientific knowledge, may have shrugged its shoulders and conceded to reality on any number of points. These are beliefs that cannot be refuted by facts. And in politics, honesty, while scarce, spin propaganda tools of the trade, we know, False beliefs that cannot be refuted by facts amongst the loyal is no accident. It is engineered. Why do they do it? Because it works. Deceit is a path to money, fame, and power for some. There are the criminal-minded ones that we're familiar with, the Ponzi schemes, tax frauds, real estate phone scams. We expect these people to wind up in jail eventually. But there are also those whose business it is to misinform. Worse than that, they seek to make you immune from facts. And it's working with great result. We see it in over 300,000 dead Americans from COVID-19. We see it in decades of gun violence, discrimina- discrimination, criminalization of poverty. And we're watching as the climate is compromised to the point of no return. All of this continues as long as people have false beliefs that cannot be refuted by facts. There is no substitution for real knowledge and experience in this world, which is why we bring you reports from those who have it here on... This Week in Science, coming up next. Gosh darn it. Waiting. I don't like Waiting it when it for the does. Music. It, it's going I'll just here. Pretend I'm, I'll just pretend I'm buffering. <laughs> uh, buffering, 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 buffering. It's never going to... It can't be smiling while buffering, because it's never in your face. It's always... That turned up. Oh... Uh, Okay, ready? Three, two. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I wanna learn everything. I wanna fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I wanna know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening this week in science? What's happening? What's happening? Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, too, 
Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about the science, all three of us. This is our last episode before we take a very <gasps> oh, no. short holiday oh. break. Okay. We will not be here next week, but we return before the new year with our top 11 of 2020. The Top 11 Countdown is our next show in two weeks. I hope you all are ready for that. Yeah. Are you ready, co-hosts? Are we ready? I mean, I just want to make sure it's not all COVID. (laughs) I don't know. There's more science. No. No. I just want to make a promise to everyone, if you guys are okay with that, that it won't all be about COVID. (laughs) I th- I think that's a very good promise to make. Okay, great. It can't it can't be all about COVID. I mean, hey, no. look if you are if you're interested in this week in science without COVID, uh, we are at 804 episodes. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you can probably <laughs> dial back just not that far uh, over the many many years we've been doing this and find episodes. Packed full of information you might have yeah. just 750 missed at the time. something without COVID for sure. <laughs> all right. Right. That's right. A whole year without COVID. But this week, yeah, we've got our COVID update like we normally do because that's what it seemed. What, what, there's a lot of science about that this year, but we have other science and I have stories about extinctions. Touch. Mm-hmm. Got a story about touch and computer coding and where you where you do that in your brain. Ooh, it's interesting. I don't is that code no, is in it, my brain? Do I? Is that well, language center? Course. Is that math center? This well, great that's a great question. question. Yeah. Great question. Yes, and science has figured it out. Yes. Justin, what did you bring for the show? Uh, I've got less hurricanes, but not in the necessarily good way. Uh, <laughs> oldest, furthest galaxy ever. Ever? Ever? Ooh, fun. Yeah. Uh, stop blaming the Mongols, and we might need to start learning about Mond. That's all about Mond. Mond. Yes. We've talked about Mond on the show before. We've talked about it. We've I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to talk it up right now. You can talk about it when you talk about that story. Yeah, talk about yeah. it when you talk about it, Justin. We're teasing I'll talk Mond. about it when I want to talk about it, which is when I talk about it. <laughs> when you oh, okay. talk about it. <laughs> I'm glad Don't we got sorted out. <laughs> What's in the animal <laughs> corner? Oh, I have spiders in space and um, fish talking on their own AM radio station. AM what? what? It's, you know, <laughs> we'll talk about it when we talk about it. <laughs> but wait, I want to talk about that one right now. <laughs> I want to know right now. Mm -hmm. What's this about? They have their own frequency that they can talk through the water, and it's like an AM radio, but I mean, we're going to talk about it when we talk about it. We'll talk about it when we talk about it. (laughs) Which might be during Blair's Animal Corner. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So you got to wait for that one. But let's jump into all these fun stories so we can talk about these things that we want to talk about and get to the point when we talk about them. If you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us everywhere podcasts are. You can find us in the Google Podcast Play area. You can find us in the Apple Podcast area. Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, Spotify, Pandora, the Radio.com, all over the place. You can find us. Look for This Week in Science. You can also find us on YouTube, that's where we broadcast live, as well as on Twitch. We are at Twist Science, T-W-I-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, Twist Science on Twitch, and on Facebook. We also broadcast live there as well. Again, look for This Week in Science. You can also go directly to our website, twist.org, to find out more about any episode. All right, calendars. I have mailed things out. From this point on, we cannot promise any more calendars arriving before the Christmas holiday, but calendars are on their way to those who have ordered them so far. If you would like a 2021 calendar, they are still available, and they will be until supplies run out. So get your calendar today. I can try and get it to you before the end of the year in time for 2021. Because that's when you need it. It, yes. if, even if you open it at Christmas, it's like, ah, I can't use it for two weeks. What it. a rip. 
I thought I was going to be able to use it right now. Exactly. But if you get his New Year's gift, that's when it's really yeah. going to be useful. They are at twist.org. Click on the horny frog link. All right, you guys ready for the science? So ready. So ready. We were born ready for the science. All right, my first story is about evolution. And we talk a lot about evolution, and uh, we've talked about extinction events, and we... You, you might have heard us, and maybe in school or in your own ex- exploration of evolution, you may have heard of things like the um, about the KT boundary, where a bunch of organisms died and then new organisms radiated out, and potentially the the dinosaur extinction that made room for mammals to adapt and grow and take up all the habitats that dinosaurs had been taking up until that point. And that led to humans. Yay! And so when we think about evolution, we normally think, all right, it goes along at its kind of normal pace, and then you have a big extinction event, and that makes room for organisms, and then you have what's called radiation. And so in our minds, we tend to pair extinctions with radiations. First the extinction, then the radiation of species. Because you have space, species can take over. Well, some researchers decided they were going to use artificial intelligence to look at the patterns, just look at all the data in extinctions and adaptations and radiations over the years. Scientists at the Earth Life Sciences Institute at Tokyo Institute of Technology used machine learning to examine the co-occurrence of fossil fossil species. They found that... dun dun dun. Extinctions and radiations are not connected. It happens sometimes, but generally not so much, that more often they are completely separate. Well, wait a second. So I guess I guess it may be a, uh, a some sort of a problem in terms or in timing and when you were... Because obviously there have been many extinctions, big extinction events. Yes. And obviously, there is life everywhere. Yes. So life must have, at some point, radiated everywhere? Or does radiated have to be like you do it fast? <laughs> like you, I mean, you know, like, now, nah, right. after that extinction, life just moseyed into every niche just and biome. That was, made its <laughs> way. Was that? Yeah, well, the idea was uh, that we've had is creative, dis- creative destruction. And this is the concept of evolution, really, that you have destruction, extinction, and that allows the creativity of evolution to take to take over. Um, but the data does not support that hmm. at all. They compared the impacts of extinction and radiation across the Phanerozoic Eon. Uh, this is it represents from about 550 million years a- a- ago to. Uh, from about 550 million years ago to the present day. And this is where we have fossils in the fossil record. Um, And before this, there weren't really any fossils, so there was nothing really to look at. And so looking at all these fossils, what they found is that many of the remarkable periods of radiation, like you're saying, Justin, kind of this moseying, it occurred when life entered new evolutionary and ecological arenas so there was also the came there was the cambrian explosion of a- animal diversity there was the carboniferous expansion of forest biomes and this did not rely on extinction events they don't have any information on bacteria because no fossils um and there are about five the big five mass extinction events the end Permian mass extinction, about 70% of species estimated to go extinct. They uh, suggest we're now entering another one. B- the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, like I mentioned, the KT boundary. Um, they The KT dinosaur event has conventionally been thought to have been like this wasteland that allowed for the radiation of species. Um, and if that destruction hadn't taken place, the idea is that the radiation would not necessarily have happened. But all of the data they're looking at suggests that there was a lot of stuff around and it wasn't necessarily the creative destruction that 
necessarily led to the radiations that then took place. This this is going to be a hard one for me to unlearn. <laughs> I know. Um, just because everything we understand about like empty niches and how that creates like a vacuum that animals then are trying to figure out the best way to use that niche. Mm. Like that is that is fundamental to a lot of how I understand life progressed. And, you know, mammals, right? Uh, the whole thing was that these mammals were little shrew things. And then once the dinosaurs were gone, they came upstairs. <laughs> That's like, right. Here you are. There's nobody up so, here. Come on up. So, I mean, there was so, that to an extent, but to Justin's comment from before, it's the time scales that we're talking mm -hmm. about were so large that this radiation took place over a long, long period of time. And all the radiations that have happened took over took place over hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Geological time scales are hard for the human mind to wrap itself around, and we like these tidy stories. Um, and just from the from the machine learning perspective, the artificial intelligence does not see the same pattern that we have decided was there. Yep. 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 Well, yeah. And so what I... they're 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 <laughs> coining a new term. They uh, they're calling. Uh, destructive creation instead of creative destruction. They found that in the Phanazeric era, species that made up an ecosystem at any one time are almost all gone by 19 millions late, million years later. Um, and then when these extinctions or radiations happen, the turnover is a lot faster. So these extinctions and radiations drive a lot of species turnover. And there's a real question right now to do with this new era that we are entering, the Anthropocene, and the uh, this sixth extinction that has been suggested is that it's eroding biodiversity that was already disrupted, but it will take at least eight million years for the biodiversity to revert to the average of 19 million years of of disappearance. So we are erasing things a lot faster than they would normally be erased. Yeah, and you don't get them back. Uh, no. That's that's the crazy thing, you know. Uh, you There would have been, I think the mammals would have done okay, Blair. Uh, we would have been able to come upstairs uh, very, very reasonably soon uh, if, there, if the, if the uh, asteroid had missed. Uh, yeah, it might have come, because there was might have a, come upstairs anyway. Well, no, because there, there was, was a, a niche, global right? there was a global ice age that was coming anyway, uh, and and it, you know there were dinosaurs in the Canadian tundra where you were looking at polar bears a while back. You know that's not a place you would think dinosaurs could survive. Why the climate was tropical up there? There were alligators, and crocodiles, well, or something in, in Montana. So there, there's challenges now that we've talked about on the show that say that dinosaurs might have been somewhat endothermic. So mm -hmm. yeah, dinosaurs, perhaps. dinosaurs could okay, they were big. They could just be, have internal heat just based on their size. However, however, there were also the the climate was tropical. I mean, there was plant life and and the like in Greenland, uh, swampy uh, alligators living in Montana. Like, this was a different climate. Once that all got cold and you had this di oh, suddenly, maybe, perhaps, in inaccessible to some smaller dinosaurs, maybe. Couldn't go into, handle the cold, cold weather. Little furry mammals would have had to find time and could have, could have uh, radiated that way. I but want to radiate to your story that comes up next. Justin, what story do you, get? What story do you have to tell us? I have a story about high-resolution supercomputer simulations. Mm, from uh, artificial is, intelligence to supercomputers, we're so techy today. I know not, this is yeah. <laughs> in uh, the journal Science Advances. It's uh, looking at global warming, and it finds that global warming will reduce the number of hurricanes in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Yay! Well, unfortunately, there are no hurricanes in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Uh, technically, they have uh, uh, typhoons, cyclones, and typhoons, tropical yeah. cyclones, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but other than that, they're exactly the same thing as the as the hurricanes that hit the U.S. South and East Coasts every year. Those numbers are going to be going down uh, in that area. It's different ocean, different uh, dynamics going on. They're predicting a reduced number. This is out of South Korea's IBS Center for Climate Physics at 
Kusan National University. They ran their computer model simulations for present day atmospheric gas composition and then doubled and quadrupled CO2 concentrations uh, over time. They ran for 13 months the simulation on one of South Korea's fastest supercomputers named Alif. It's generated the equivalent of 2,001 terabyte hard disks of data. It's a really big number. Lots of bits. That's a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And they found, yeah, overall, uh, you're gonna, they're going to be experiencing less hurricanes, typhoons, and <laughs> tropical cyclones. However, the ones that they do experience uh, looked to be bigger, stronger, and will travel further inland because they will be uh, much higher rated numbered, uh, what do you call it? So, worse hurricanes in the uh, India, South uh, Pacific area, but, but uh, less of them overall. All right. So, I mean, it's good news. Good news? Bad news? Good news? It's bad news. Because, uh, like, the smaller ones you can handle. And then, actually, yeah. what they really... Then they also cranked the thing up to, like, 11. Just to right. see what would happen. Like, if these silly humans, like, really, really don't learn, and we double the quadruple it again, what, what, what happens? And they, what they saw was this interesting effect of a suppression of hurricanes. Uh, they started to become suppressed. They started not to form. Uh, what ended up happening instead, though, is you just had torrential downpour everywhere all the time. So there was... There's a trade-off, for sure. There's always a trade-off, because <laughs> the energy and the water is going to stay somewhere. If you take it all out of the ice, it's going to be in play somewhere in the world. Yep, somewhere. And, uh, yeah, just to tack on to this story, there's another story in the news about just how much carbon dioxide plants can take right mm. and we might be hitting the hitting the maximum for hmm. how peak much plant? carbon dioxide plants can absorb plant? and use we're, we're getting there we're, we're almost a peak plant that's right wow. <sighs> let's do something blair yeah what news do you have for us Oh, well, I have uh, a way that we can get more clean water. So that's some good news. I knew you um, had something positive. Does it have anything yes, to do yeah. with melting icebergs? Well, <laughs> no, it actually has to do with nano diamonds. So I don't know how achievable this is, but let's let's explore. So, nano <laughs> diamonds, we could at... make those. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, oil recovery methods and other industrial processes make really, 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 really hot wastewater and so the the problem is not only do you have to clean it but you actually have to cool it before you clean it then you clean it through osmosis membranes then you have to heat it up again before it can be considered reusable so all that to say uh that's a lot of energy and that's a lot to go through to decontaminate water um and uh the way to get around that potentially is with Nano diamonds. So researchers have uh, previously explored a little bit with embedded tiny nano diamonds, which are carbon spe spheres produced by explosions in small closed containers with, without oxygen. Um, and they put those on these membranes. And in these previous studies, they effectively and quickly filtered large volumes of water, but they didn't test with the hot water, which is really the thing here. How can we effectively, quickly filter water without cooling it down just to heat it back up again. And so uh, this research team looked, uh, they attached amines to the nano diamonds, bathed them in ethyl acetate solution to prevent them from clumping, and then added a monomer that reacted with the amines to create chemical links to the traditional membrane base. And so they found thicker, more temperature stable membranes, which had an improvement in their performance. So by increasing the amount of these amine enhanced nano diamonds in the membrane, they had better filtration rates. And this was even after nine hours at 167 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so they, it seems, it seems um, promising. It to does. Get some, some nice clean water. 
It does seem promising. And, you know, I, I did say we can make nano diamonds, and mm -hmm. it's true. Synthetic diamonds are easily made, actually. And yeah. Um, yeah. that's, the, <laughs> that's yeah. the kind of thing that we can use our technology to do. So this is not, this is something, uh, di diamonds come from carbon. Carbon is plentiful. Maybe we can take the carbon dioxide in the air and take the carbon out of that and turn it into nano, nano diamonds and use it to clean the water. Like the question is, is the energy used to create the nano diamonds still less than the energy it takes to cool the water down and then heat it back up again? This is a good question. Yes. I would I would guess that in no. the long run, I'm gonna say yes. No. <laughs> I would say, you know, if you can mass produce the nano diamonds and they can be used over and over, mm -hmm. then this could potentially be a benefit. But um, yeah, in the short term, I feel like it's yeah, it's not probably not an improvement <laughs> yeah they'd have to be they have to be reusable yeah. for it to yeah. Yeah. i'm uh, reusable diamonds they're the toughest thing ever what's more uh, it's got to be re reusable right reusable nano diamonds i would imagine just wash them off use them again it'll be good yeah. you know what we wash off and use over and over and over again what our faces oh okay <laughs> I thought you were gonna say something gross <laughs> No, I don't have anything gross to say. I just want to talk about the human face. I want to talk about the wonderful face that we that we share around the world. And researchers decided, again, yes, they're using technology, using um, artificial intelligence to determine how often these faces, these facial expressions that we use to express emotion how often they are used similarly around the world. It's published in today's issue of Nature, and uh, the researchers from UC Berkeley say, the study reveals how remarkably similar people are in different corners, corners of the world in how we express emotion in the face of the most meaningful context of our lives. This was a worldwide analysis of facial ex expressions from uh, UC Berkeley and Google. They used machine learning technology, a deep neural network, to analyze six million video clips on YouTube for facial expressions. These people were in countries around the world, 144 different ones. And this is the first time that they have really looked at what was happening. So they used the machine learning to determine all of the different expressions that are associated with 16 different emotions that they defined. So shock, awe, happiness, uh, a bunch of different things. The machine learning uh, was looking at the position of the faces related to all of the different muscles that create these looks. And then in addition to just identifying the facial expression and tying it to a particular emotion, they then compared that to the context in which the video was taking place. So um, watching fireworks, for example, people dancing or you know, whatever you could imagine, these different scenarios that were taking place in videos. What were people looking like? What emotions were they expressing and how in the videos? And did the facial expressions line up around the world? And lo and behold, yes, they did. Yes, they did. The uh, expressions that they looked at, they pretty much found that there were nuances in facial behavior, but they're all similar around the world. Our emotions are similar in similar situations, awe during fireworks displays, contentment during weddings, uh, concentration, the furrowing of the brow uh, when performing a physical task, doubt at protests, pain at weightlifting or other physical work um, there are all these all these faces show how completely similar that we we are as humans and the researcher Dasher Keltner says this supports Darwin's theory that expressing emotion in our faces is universal among humans the physical display of our emotions may define who we are as a species enhancing our communication and cooperation skills and ensuring our survival so even as we feel so divided around the world we can look at each other and know that we can understand each other at least in our faces hmm. yeah i i really live living abroad 
<laughs> um, nonverbal communication was a big deal for me. Yeah. I got very good at it by the end of my six months. And uh, yeah, facial facial expressions are a huge part of it. I wonder, I wonder if you couldn't see someone's face that you're trying to communicate with if you didn't share their language. But you could still like act things out. Um, would it be as effective? And I don't think so. <laughs> Acting things out works. People yeah. people use body language, improvised sign language all the but time. But it's part of it, I think, is my point. I feel like I really, it was a very important piece of the puzzle for me, for yeah. sure. For sure. Justin, want to give us another story? Oh, do I have another one? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this is a... Team of Tokyo University astronomers used Keck 1 telescope to measure the distance of an ancient galaxy. They deduced that the galaxy GN-Z11 is not only the oldest galaxy, but is the most distant, which also kind of makes sense because wouldn't that be the way that... Well, it would be the oldest to us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but oldest, it is the oldest yes. and the most distant. Oldest meaning perhaps closest to the original thing that might have happened that made it so that there was space instead of nothing. Uh, yeah, so it, the distance it defines is a very boundary of our observable universe. Beyond that, I guess it's just darkness, blackness, void. Can't see anything. Nothing's making it through yet. Team hopes the study can shed light uh, on a period of cosmological history when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. So here's a galaxy in our universe that's a galaxy of the universe is only a couple hundred million years old at this point. That's when we're talking about these mass extinction events and we're talking about covering hundreds of millions of 500 million years, was it, from the KT event? Mm -hmm. This There was a whole galaxy that had radiated and was caught in its own orbit must have probably had a black hole in the middle i don't know professor noburani kashikawa from the department of astronomy at the university of tokyo driven by his curiosity about galaxies sought out the most distant one we could observe to find out how and when it came to be uh this is quoting voice uh of Kashikawa, from previous studies, the galaxy GN-Z11 seems to be the furthest detectable galaxy from us at 13.4 billion light years. Yeah, and it is wow. or uh, 134 nonillion kilometers. <laughs> For those who aren't familiar with that. That's uh, really far. Yeah. Uh, 134 <laughs> nonillion kilometers is approximately the same as 134 <laughs> decillion meters. It's uh, 134 <laughs> by 33. Thank you so much <laughs> for the art. According to Kashikawa, measuring and verifying such distance is not an easy task. Uh, they measured the redshift of GN-Z11. Redshift being... The way that light stretches out, becomes redder the further it travels. But they also had to look through certain chemical signatures called emission lines that imprint distinct patterns in the light from these very distant objects. By measuring how stretched these telltale signatures are, they could figure out how far the light must have traveled. And it gave them a distance for the target at that <clears throat> many, many, many zeros. It's a... It's a 134 followed by 30 zeros if you're doing the kilometers it's a lot of a lot of zeros that's uh, a we lot looked... of zeros i'm just thinking just for a quick moment though 13 13.4 billion light years away that is that's like over that, that's about four times no three times the age of our solar system we're at about four and a half billion years so our solar system could have come up three times in the time that this one galaxy. If you had a starship going warp 10 
It would take you 1.3 billion years to get there. Yeah. Well, but at 1. warp 10, 4. you start time travel. So that's all. It's 9.9. .9. Warp 9.9. <laughs> <laughs> So I think isn't warp isn't warps a factor of uh, speed of light? I, I don't it was. know. I I believe so, except that warp ten is funny. Just if you're following the real canon and the lore, it's a whole. Never mind. It's a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. It is. Uh, this uh, ship. Goes at warp to ten, you are everywhere all at the same time. Yeah, I think that happens every time. It's just more <laughs> noticeable then. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, uh, what is, okay. So they looked uh, specifically at ultralight, uh, at the area electromagnetic spectrum expected to find the redshift chemical signatures. According to Kashikawa, the Hubble Space Telescope detected the signature multiple times in the spectrum of GN-7, or Z-11, excuse me. However... Even the Hubble cannot resolve ultraviolet emission lines to the degree we needed, so we turned to a more up-to-date ground-based spectrograph and instrument to measure the emission lines called MOSFIRE, which is mounted to the Keck-1 uh, telescope in Hawaii. MOSFIRE captured the emission lines from GN-Z11 in detail, which allowed the team to make a much better estimation on its distance than was possible from previous data. Pretty amazing. Farthest and oldest galaxy. And it doesn't even have like a really catchy name. GN dash Z11. It's, it's all right. I guess you can sing it. You can sing <laughs> you it can, out. Yeah, you can sing it out. I mean, it's the, it's the, the season of Elf. You know, we, hi, I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> you can turn, any, no, you can no, turn no, anything into a song. It's okay. Yeah. It's that season. It is. Fada in the chat room. Blair, at warp 10, you devolve to a salamander and have egg babies with your captain. Yes, that's the episode where <laughs> that happens. And that's why. Because you're at all places and times at the same time. So you de-evolve. It's a whole thing. I'm just telling you. The, the, lore the, and the, the canon. theory behind warp goes completely off the rails and to every space in time. In that particular episode, <laughs> that's the whole thing. Is that but, just because they didn't have their um, warp one is Heisenberg? Light speed down, so. uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just didn't have the Heisenberg dampeners on. That's all. That's right. They, that, you gotta dampen the uncertainty. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, they had mm -hmm, uncertainty yeah. principle dampeners. They had to have those. <sighs> they must have been faulty. You know where there's not a lot of uncertainty. Where. <laughs> Computer no. code. Oh. oh, computer code. Oh. Computer code, yes. Mm. And while people learn various languages in which to program, there's been this, just way we think about it. It's a language, computer programming. You read the computer programming language. And so researchers wanted to know, does our brain treat computer code like a language or something else? So... They studied it. Yes, they did. Uh, researchers published in eLife this week, Evelina Fedorenko, the Frederick A. and Carol J. Middleton Career Development Associate Professor of Neuroscience and a member of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research, is the senior author on this paper. And also there were researchers from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and Tufts University. In the study, they used functional magnetic resonance imaging, and the researchers showed people snippets of code, little bits of code, and asked them to read it, to say, okay, if you read this code, what will the code do? What's it going to produce? What is that code for? And when they were looking at the brain, looking specifically in the language regions of the brain, we do have language centers of the brain that allow us to understand language and produce language. That's not where activity was happening. No, no, no. Computer programming code is not a language to our brain, even though we might mentally consider it that, that way. It's a metaphor, really, because... The coding task mainly got involved in what's called the multiple demand network. And this is in the frontal and parietal lobes in the brain and is needed when you are holding 
lots of information of different kinds in your brain at the same time. So when you're solving puzzles or yeah. when you are mm -hmm. uh, doing yeah, crossword puzzles, really, uh, there are lots of skills that take on this multiple demand network, but it is in relation to skills, to things that take lots of different kinds of information. Um, so math and coding, you, you, you said, may ask this Justin earlier, whether it was a, a math center and yeah, math and coding rely on the same brain areas and possibly mechanisms. I was picturing the way that I, I mean, I don't code, but I, I do a little bit of um, web editing and I'm not formally trained at all. And so I have to kind of use it. it I think Translate it's the same it. part of my brain, actually, that I would use in an escape room is like, <laughs> if I do this, then this happens. But I do, mm -hmm. do this, then that happens. So in order to get this, I need to do this and this and that and this and that. Did it work? No. OK, let's try that again. Do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's totally... That's, that's where I feel like my brain is at when I'm doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, so this, this in itself, because there's not a specific area of the brain that is like, this is the coding area of the brain. Um, so there's no real answer as to... Yet. Yet, <laughs> as to how, how the, or what the best way to teach coding is, because we can approach coding as a language but we have to understand that the brain is not interpreting it as a language. So should it then be taught as pro a problem-solving tool? Uh, is What are the best methods for future education in coding? And how can we, how can we teach it most effectively? And that's the, the, the big question moving forward. And you know, maybe, it is, maybe it is somewhat like math. You just got to do a lot of it. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. But I find it very interesting. Puts that question to rest. Coding. Nope. Nope. You're not learning a language. I think people will still use the metaphor, though. Oh, yeah. Well, for then, sure. well then code code, uh, code makes sense, but language uh, doesn't anymore. Yeah. I think it's fair to call it a code. Yeah. It's code. Instead of a coder, you should call yourself a code breaker. Ooh. A uh, crypto... Code breaker. Something. Cryptophile? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Crypt no, cryptographer? I just went to crypt cryptographer. I just went to cryptonomicron. So anyway, <laughs> it's time for me to tell you. If you just tuned in, you are joining This Week in Science. This Week in Science is a weekly science program. We talk, we have fun. We enjoy curiosity. If you are interested in an item of our merchandise, please check out our Zazzle store at twist.org. Click the link, Zazzle, and you'll be able to find our store where there are all sorts of wonderful items uh, for, that will help support this show moving forward and make you feel pretty cool because you'll have some twist gear. That'll be pretty awesome. Yep. All right, you ready for the COVID update? Yeah, let's have it. Hopefully there's something good this week. It's all good. Da -da -da -da. It, <sighs> it's all good. I've only got good news. I didn't bring any bad for you. Does that, does that, Kiki, does that mean that there isn't any bad news? Um, no, it just means <laughs> the stories I brought are all good yeah. news. <laughs> okay, okay. Just yeah. to... Really, truly. <laughs> just making sure. Uh. All right, so I would like you first to know, if you haven't heard, vaccines are being distributed around the United States. Healthcare workers and those at extremely high risk are being vaccinated around the United States for COVID-19. This is momentous. It is amazing. Under a year, vaccines went from concept to manufacture to delivery and and it and hopefully we will see see things really improving over the next several months but this is really great news we went from last week kind of fingers crossed that the fda would give an emergency use authorization to pfizer and oh yes they did 
on uh, on a on a, a weekend night, no doubt. And then Monday morning, the first injections began. Vaccines are out. And now the big decisions are going to be who's going to get which v- vaccines and when. That's the that's the really big question moving forward. There are the Pfizer vaccine so far is the only vaccine that has been given emergency youth author- use authorization. Moderna's next in line. Uh, we can probably uh, probably be certain that Oxford AstraZeneca's vaccine, their adenovirus vaccine, will be next up after that. Um, and then there are a suite of other types of vaccines and uh, that, that are made with different uh, strategies and also Nasal sprays are coming mm. up. This is a big question, and a friend of mine brought it up on Facebook this weekend. Since this is a respiratory disease, why are we getting a muscle shot for the vaccine? So to answer that question, number one is that the intramuscular injections tend to lead to a stronger systemic immune response. And so your body, your whole body, is going to be immune and able to fight it off, fight a virus off or an invader off more more effectively. However, there's this question about the nasal mucosa and the respiratory tract. So this is a respiratory disease. If your your body itself is going to be good at fighting things off, but your nose is the first line of defense... Shouldn't we really be focusing on your nose and your respiratory tract? Um, There are very few inhalable vaccines. We do have a a flu mist. There is a a flu nasal spray that you can inhale, and that was uh, one that was worked on very hard. The company that did bring that flu nasal spray to the market is also working on a COVID-19 vaccine, and it is, uh, I believe it's, it's on its way to clinical trials now. There are some other uh, researchers who just published in Cell this week about a new methodology to create inhalable nasal spray vaccines, and they hope that it will not just create a COVID-19 vaccine, but eventually mm-hmm. an, a, a vaccines that will be highly effective against all respiratory diseases, anything that will, will attack you through your nose or your or your lungs that uh, these inhalables will f- give first line of defense priority to your respiratory system, and then that will like then lead out to the systemic lead to systemic um, immunity. These researchers think that instead of multiple shots, you'll be able to go get one nasal spray sniff and and you'll be good to go. Um, researchers in Spain just started a clinical trial. There's another clinical trial in the UK for nasal spray uh, vaccines for COVID-19. So if you are afraid of needles, there might be something on its way for you in the near future, which is pretty cool. And then beyond that, inhalable antibodies are moving forward. There is a company just published in BioArchive, their research on inhalable antibodies and the antibodies would be neutralizing antibodies the kind of thing that your body would produce but instead of your body producing it you'd have a daily nasal spray that you would sniff in the morning and it would stay within your nasal mucosa and within your respiratory tract protecting you and neutralizing any COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus that enters your respiratory airways. And so it would be uh, a preventative as opposed to a vaccine preventative, but the kind of thing that you could that you could take on a daily basis if you are unable to get the vaccine for some reason. So this is a different direction that people are looking. AstraZeneca, and there's another question that people have been asking, which I think is a really great question. It's like, well, what if, you know, I'm supposed to go get these two shots, these is these vaccine, you get one shot, you wait a month, you come back and get another shot. But what if they run out of the kind of vaccine that you got? Can I get another one of the vaccines? And will that work just as well? Can we mix and match vaccines and doses? Nobody knows this yet, um, but AstraZeneca is partnering with Gamalaya, the Russian company that is producing the Russian adenovirus-based vaccine, and they are going to test this question as to whether or not you can take the AstraZeneca virus 
and the uh, Gamalaya, vi- the, not virus, the Astra- AstraZeneca vaccine and the Gamalaya vaccine. And uh, at and I don't, I'm not sure what, about the timing of it, whether those two shots would be the exact same time, but whether that would hmm. challenge your immune system enough to create the kind of immune response that would be efficacious in protecting you from um, protecting you from COVID-19. So, so, of course, my my knee jerk reaction was like, no, don't do that. That seems yeah. wrong. Obviously, that's not going to work. And then, of course, my actual scientific part of my brain was like, oh, wait, if they're supposed to work the same way, if they're two vaccines that are using the same mechanism, why couldn't you mix them? Why couldn't you? Right. So AstraZeneca, Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca uses an adenovirus vector. Um, and it's the same adenovirus for both of the two doses. The Gamalaya vaccine uses two different adenovirus vectors. So why couldn't you? That is, I, it, yeah. it, they're using the same spike protein as the right. actual thing that your body is going to react to. The adenovirus is just the vector to get it into your cells. Mm-hmm. Why not? Mm-hmm. And so we don't want people trying this on their own, no. but <laughs> but I think it's very exciting to see that these companies are are thinking in this direction and and they're thinking about it in in terms of potentially the scarcity issue of will there be enough doses of vaccines to get to everybody who needs them at all mm-hmm. times. But the other side of it is also can you get people to come to both visits to get the two doses and if you can do both of them with this mix and match in one sitting that Mm. could put it could potentially solve a whole bunch of problems yeah interesting well and i'll say um just probably what justin would say he stepped out for a second but um the good news is all this stuff is in the in the works but it doesn't mean anything if you go out right now and get sick. <laughs> so you're right. This is yeah. it's the home stretch. This is it's what it means. Home There's stretch. light at the end of the tunnel. Stay home. Don't do anything risky because pretty soon you could be vaccinated and do all of the things. So you just yes. have to you have to hold on long enough to be able to get the vaccine and to not already be in the ICU. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's i mean that's the bottom line really Mm -hmm. we need to we need to stay healthy long enough to get a vaccine we need to stay healthy long enough to stay out of the icu all these things work together everyone keep it up the holidays we can make it through i know that uh in the uk they're talking about relaxing some precautions over the christmas holiday Maybe keep your Christmas small still. Don't take advantage of relaxation. Just take advantage. I look, Okay, my perspective on this year's winter holiday is for the first time ever, I don't have to drive to all the family. <laughs> yes. And I don't have to host any of the family. I get a very quiet holiday and it's going to be there very nice. I'm looking on the bright. I am I am Miss Bright Side here. That is for sure. Send your family the presents <laughs> and open your presents together over a video call. And then yes. you have the whole rest of the day to yourself. <laughs> the whole day to read those books, to go for a long <laughs> walk outside. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be great. Yes. It's going to be fantastic. <sighs> All right. I had another story, but I don't really feel like talking about it because that was enough COVID for one show. It really, really was. So we're going to move on forward again. Thank you so much for being a part of This Week in Science. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing us into your lives. If you want to help Twist Grow, tell a friend to subscribe today. That would help a lot. All right. We are coming back right now with that special part of the show that we know and love as the panda squirrel poo corner. No, wait. (laughs) Blair's animal corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, millipede, no pet at all. 
you want to hear about animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels, and a What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness, I have a tail. I have a tail. Whoa, wow. What? <laughs> so you <laughs> have you always noticed. had a tail? I have a tail. You never noticed. T-A-L-E. Oh my goodness. Oh. Those spiders in space. Um... So did, did we? Did, and... did you both know that there are arachnids on our planet? <laughs> there are Wait. spiders who their entire job is to go to space someday. I did not know this. Yes. So this is something that uh, NASA has has worked on for a while. Uh, wanted to see how spiders act in zero gravity. In two thousand eight. It was all part of something related to um, inspiring middle schoolers to do science. I don't know. Um, but they took <laughs> specimens do and we need they a flew reason? them to the International <laughs> Space Station. But um, chaos ensued. So a spider <laughs> managed to break out of his storage chamber <laughs> because into of the course. main chamber. So it was double containment, at least. Into the main chamber. So there was a main spider that they were trying to get to, to build webs in zero gravity. And then they had a backup spider. The backup spider got into the main chamber with the main spider. And they just made a mess, basically. Oh, wow. So so that experiment out the window. Um, they couldn't open the, cha- the chamber for safety reasons, obviously, because if the spider actually got out onto the space station, that would be... That's what I thought had happened when you yeah, said yeah. it escaped its containment. I was I immediately so, was like... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that was a bust. Not to mention, they brought flies up for food, and they reproduced more quickly than they thought they would in space. And over time, the larva crawled out of the breeding container onto the floor of the case into the experimental chamber. And after two weeks, they could not even see the spiders because there was so much fly larva. So anyway, in general, th- they learned some things in 2008. <laughs> so then... In 2011, <laughs> um, they brought four spiders of the same species. Um, two, they flew to the ISS in separate habitats. Two stayed on Earth in separate habitats so that they could um, compare and contrast how they mm-hmm. built webs in uh, zero-G and in just norm The same Earth. container. Yeah, so uh, they, they wanted to have these identical conditions. But uh, alas, there was another problem. This, oh, no. this this experiment turned out okay overall, but they they thought they were bringing four females into the study. But spiders are very hard to sex when they're juveniles, and so unfortunately, two of them ended up being male. But <laughs> one of them was on the space station. Oh, perfect. And- one of them was on Earth. So, oh, good luck. Okay, great. So our variables are still controlled. That's fantastic. Um, and so then they were able to go ahead with the experiment. And this is actually what this is about. So they were able to analyze the symmetry of spider webs and the orientation of those webs, about 100 spider webs, um, using 14,500 images. So they could use um, all sorts of um, analysis to figure out kind of the difference between these two. Basically, they wanted to see if these webs had similar properties or different properties to they like they do in gravity. So first of all, on Earth, spiders build asymmetrical webs with the corner towards the upper edge which once I read it, I was like, oh yeah. Um, And when resting, spiders pretty much always sit with their head downwards because that's how they can Mm -hmm. move quickest to prey, the direction of gravity. So when they looked at all of these images, they found that webs built in zero gravity were indeed more symmetrical than those spun on Earth. Mm -hmm. Their center was closer to the middle. The spiders did not always keep their heads downwards. But that makes sense. Oh, there's a but. I mean, I, mean, I was going to say that it makes sense that they wouldn't always keep, wouldn't always keep their head downwards because really yeah. what is down in microgravity? And then the, the totally. symmetry, yeah. the symmetry kind of makes sense because if they're building it out in a symmetrical way, it's gravity that's distorting the web ultimately. Yeah. Right. right. So this is where it gets interesting, though. They had on their hands another confounding variable they did not think about that actually created an interesting discovery. There were lamps. And what they found was that it made a difference whether the spiders built their webs in lamplight or in the dark. 
When they were built in lamplight, they were asymmetrical as terrestrial webs, orienting the center of the web towards the light and angling their body away from the light. So mm-hmm. basically they were they were treating the light source like a like bait. No, they were treating the light source like the sun, basically. So it was mm-hmm. like Yeah, so it it gave them an idea. They figured away from the light was down. So they first of all, they were very fortunate that the lamps happened to all be attached at the top of the chambers and they didn't just kind of put them where they fit, because if they were all over, they would have had mm-hmm. no idea or they would have had to do all of this again. Um, but so they were all placed in the same place. So that gave them this clue that the lamps had this impact. So the spiders rested in or- arbitrary orientations when the light was turned off. But then when it was on, they used it as an as an aid when gravity was absent. Um, so, of course, having a backup system for gravity in general seems surprising for a species that has only ever lived on Earth. <laughs> Why would you have a backup system for lacking gravity? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. But they're using light as this backup system for orientation. The only hypothesis that researchers threw in here is that their sense of position could become confused when they're building a web. The hmm. organ responsible for, um, for their, their orientation sense um, registers the relative position of the front body to the back and during construction those two body parts are constantly moving around so it's possible that the orientation that they could be getting from gravity is out of whack because they're just spinning all over the place making this web and so using the light might be their secondary source now this is totally not yet tested no i it's just a theory here based on what we have because otherwise why would they have a backup to gravity but uh but so uh, uh, but this was only in the zero g that the lamp affected it wasn't on earth um so that's a good question right yeah so i think that um that probably is is a good next step here would be to mess with yeah. light orientation on on earth but well, uh, my understanding whole... is that that gravity is the main pusher for that so so cuz here's if if i'm thinking like a spider which i don't <laughs> i don't often but in this case i'm going to throw myself out there i'm going to be a spider okay. and i got a light source be it the sun be it a lamp be it a street light, be it a porch light, whatever it is, I'm going to want to orient the center of my web towards the center of that thing. And I want to be on the business side, which is where the bugs are going to be heading towards that light source, which is opposite from, from where that light is, so that I can be ready to pounce on things as they head towards the light source and get caught in the web. And it's just Maybe I'm just thinking like a street, an urban spider, uh, versus a country spider, <laughs> but, but that's city that's spider, how, country spider. Yeah. Um, that's I think that's not my understanding. My understanding is that spider webs are pretty universally upper is where the that kind of center of the web is. Um, so the other kind of weird thing here is that there are spiders that build their webs in the dark. So <laughs> right. Um, When you're talking about Earth-dwelling spiders, there are some that don't appear to use the sun at all. Um, But orb spiders do, and they, and they, not, they don't use the sun. I mean, they obviously do, but um, Mm -hmm. we know that they build their webs during the day, and then they eat them at night, and then they Mm -hmm. build a new one the next day. So, um, so circadian rhythms are very, seem to be very important to this type of spider. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah, that so I I did not mention. Yes, it was orb weavers that were part of golden silk orb weavers, just the best um, and most terrifying uh, spider web makers. Uh, because the thing about orb weavers, <laughs> they're beautiful. They're beautiful. They're terrifying. They're really good at making webs that are invisible because they take them down every night and rebuild them every day, and so there's no detritus on there. So you could walk face first into 
or Weaver Webb, which I have almost done. I don't like it. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> they might be using light as well as gravity. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> oh, uh, from... Or weavers are beautiful and wonderful. Oh my god. Okay. Just let them build uh, all across the front of your house. No. And... Yes. <laughs> Just go outside with a stick in the morning. I don't know. And I uh, never left again. <laughs> I don't know what kind of spiders it is, but there's. Uh, we have. I think they're field spiders of some sort that build all sorts of big spider webs out there in the fields. And there's a certain time of year when we'll get like a, a decent wind. Uh, in the, I think it's in the spring or the fall, some some in between time. But all of a sudden, it can, it can occasionally start raining spider webs in mm-hmm. town. Well, they're just they'll just be drifting down. You're like, what is that? Is it a plastic bag floating there? No, no it's a big it's a big spider yeah. web. Oh, but why? Because they get lift, they, they've laid them out over the farmland, oh, and then the wind you. comes, picks them all up into the drops them down again. Kind of oh, fun. No, it's there's okay. No, let's not, talk about fish. I'm, I don't I'm think gonna, there's okay, spiders let's talk about in fish. those webs. We anymore. could talk about spiders in the after show. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about fish on their AM radio. Um, this oh, is a, yeah, this a, is the story I wanted to hear first. What yeah, is? it's. I mean, it's a stretch. I was using some flowery language, but um, this is electric fish from Brazil's Amazon rainforest. And um, the this is research from the New Jersey Institute of Technology looking at the Brazilian Amazon basin and the way that electric fish communicate. This is the first time ever that electric fish have been captured in the wild in caves communicating. So this is some, some brand new information here. Um, so they actually can communicate over long distances and they actually do liken it to am radio is when i use that whole descriptor there i'll explain why in a second um this is looking at cave adapted glass knife fish it has about uh 300 living members that we know of the whole species and has evolved from surface dwelling relatives so not that they live on land but they live in water still they're fish but they're they're up top they're in the sun they're not inside a cave where it's pitch dark and so um, it looks like they have these cave dwelling fish have sacrificed their eyes and their pigmentation, as many animals who live in the dark do. But they have gained more powerful electric organs to enhance the way that they sense prey and communicate with each other, which is where this gets really interesting. They analyze the fish's electric based communication and behavior. Uh, the way they did that is. They placed electrode grids throughout the fish's water habitats to record the measure and measure the electric fields generated by each individual fish. They uh, then the team analyzed the fish's movements and electricity based social interactions. They were able to track more than a thousand electrical based social interactions over 20 minute long recordings taken from both surface and cave fish populations. So they could compare and contrast and they discovered hundreds of specialized long distance exchanges they are really talking back and forth to me it almost sounds more like a cb radio in a in a truck um so of the nearly 80 species of cave cave fish known today that have evolved from surface dwelling fish all have developed sensory enhancements of some sort uh but this is definitely a first is this enhanced electricity for communication over wavelengths um, so it, it's also partially potentially because even the water itself in the Amazon River is very murky. And so the the surface dwellers might already have some of this technique already, which is why it was so easy for the cave fish to kind of a- augment and turn up the capabilities of this particular um, skill. And so they can communicate in absolute darkness through their electric fields. It's, yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, So this is actually, as I mentioned, it's the first time that they've been able to continuously monitor cave fish in their natural settings. And so this was uh, very cool to see them outside of the lab. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it seems like the strengths of the electric discharges in the cave fish were about 1.5 times greater than those in the surface. So definitely augmented. And uh, they can go where was it they're only like 10 centimeters long 
but they can go insane lengths considering that they can go um uh, uh meters they can go meters at a time with one electric communication even though they're only 10 centimeters long these little fishies so they can detect prey they can com com communicate with each other and uh, they have variable electric fields. So that's kind of what they do. The wavelengths change. So now we guys just kind of know what they're talking about. Yes. Yeah. We have to decode it for sure. So so then, okay, so don't, uh, this uh, already starts making me think like, do other, is this happening other places? Um, uh, yeah, I would say yes. So sharks have, uh, right? They have like this ability to s at least sense sense uh, electric signals yeah electric signals mm -hmm. i wonder if they're able to s produce them in a way that the they can see what another shark is doing some distance away yeah I or, mean, or as how far a shark as is know, feeling is this a whole secret <laughs> uh, es fish esp world that we're just it's, it's possible I, my understanding is that the the shark electromagnetic senses is pretty much limited to the electric signal that a heart would give off it's pretty okay. different from this kind of am band that they're talking about here but um it's possible i mean if if the mechanics exist why not yeah so these are these are uh i'm assuming deaf uh and uh blind well yes. they're definitely blind <laughs> Carol Ann Benoit is asking what frequency this oh, takes place at. Oh, that's a good at. question. Um, and I'm seeing in the abstract of the paper that the uh, they routinely found both surface and cave fish with sustained differences in EOD frequencies that were below 10 hertz, despite being within close proximity of about 50 centimeters. Uh, and the relative... Let's see. Pairs of fish also showed significant interactions between EOD frequencies and relative movements at large distances over 1.5 meters and at high frequent high differences in frequencies, often over 50 hertz. So it's a wide range. Looks like a wide yep. range of, of frequencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a. It seems like quite the cacophony. Um, mm -hmm. One <laughs> one of the researchers said. Um, Quote, this is the first time we've been able to continuously monitor the behavior of any cave fish in their natural setting over days. We've gained great insight into the nervous system and specialized adaptations for cave life. But it's just as exciting to learn how sociable and chatty they are with each other. It's like mid middle school, is what uh, Daphne Sorez from the New Jersey Institute of Technology says. So, I mean, that really does get at, you know, these are interactions between individuals and mm -hmm. is what is going on there. And yeah. as, what are they talking uh, about? As Golda Zader from our Twitch channel is asking, could they identify individual fish signals like unique voices? And I, that'll probably be something that is yet to yeah. be determined, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that based on their grid that they set up, they could identify which signals were coming from which fish just based on the way that they were um recording them but mm -hmm. in terms of then being able to isolate them and figure out which is which yeah they have not tried to do any of that yet again this is the first time they've ever recorded this so i think it's it's exciting preliminary yeah. results it is uh and uh so interesting kellen benoit is pointing out that uh, they were very very low frequencies and she says ah that makes sense and it does make sense because you would uh lower frequencies should travel further uh, and so you would have a longer range communication that way. Wow. Yeah, we think it's all just being quiet down there in the cave. Nope. nope. There's all sorts of chit chat going on. Lots of chit chat. <laughs> I love it. Fish talk. They talk yeah. a lot. <laughs> they sure do. They sure, sure. Who is that? Do. Who's over there? <laughs> just a lot of that. It's Jim. And Bob, you know, just Daisy, talking. Stacy, where are you? Just it's dark. talking. Just talking. <laughs> this is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you are able, we would appreciate your support. 
We appreciate your support in listening to us, but if you can, head to twist.org and click on one of the links to donate to Twist, especially during this holiday giving season. We now at Patreon have annual memberships, and you can choose between PayPal donations or joining our Patreon community. The links are available at twist.org. Click on the Patreon link to make your donation choice and ten dollars or more per month you will be thanked by name at the end of the show if that's what you wish we really do appreciate all of your support and we need your support to keep going to keep to keep running this ship and also to keep trying to spread the curiosity and sanity and science that we appreciate so much Thank yeah. you for your support. Thank you. And also, look, we need it for the brass tacks. Kiki has got a feather. That's not a loose feather from a down comforter. That's not That's not a, a hair choice that went bad. That's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Kiki, this feather has a clip on it that is holding down a button on the defective mic so that we can hear you. No, it's just my headphones so that I can hear you. So that you can hear us. Okay. Yes. Okay, it's the headphones, right. <laughs> and I, it's decorative also. It's a nice little, it's a holiday yeah. decoration. Yeah. There was some There was some question like, should, should we mention that Kiki has a feather stuck in her hair that she might not have noticed? That, it's a fancy but feather. No, it's a, a fancy very, holiday it is feather. very fancy <laughs> holiday feather. <laughs> All right, let's come back now. Justin, it's your turn to tell some stories. Oh, no. Is it? Okay, I don't know yep. if I have any more. Oh, wait, yes. Stop blaming the Mongols. It, everything wasn't their fault. Okay. I mean, they, there's what do some you mean? things. What? The, some things. Geng- Genghis, 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 I don't know. Genghis even. Khan and the Mongol hordes. Yeah, you know, they pillaging. get a lot of flack. Destruction. Well, Taking you know, over. actually, they were yeah. not that destructive if you just like conceded defeat. If, right, and then if, if you, you conceded defeat, they're the like, okay, keep your religion mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah. We'll go around you, and you can be part of the community. If right. you didn't, though, if you showed resistance, they just then they just leveled the town. So there's, you know, bad if you with the good. aren't mm-hmm. a Mongol. Uh, but there's, there was a uh, one. <laughs> What are people blaming the Mongols for? I want to know what you're talking about. For a long time, they've been uh, they've been blamed for the destruction of cent- Central Asia's river civilizations. These are ancienty ancienty civilizations that happen to have a couple of rivers. Which, when you're starting out a civilization from scratch, access to water, lots of it, is a huge benefit. It's one of these hubs where agriculture can get started for the first time. This new technology requires the bandwidth of access to water. So, you uh, you know, centuries of, of booming civilization, then the Mongols uh, invade, and suddenly after that, nothing. That whole area falls apart. And for a long time, they have blamed the Mongols for somehow mismanaging or ruining the economy or something. Turns out, no, actually climate change at the time had dried up those rivers so that they weren't as lush. And so this infrastructure of lots of lots of people who had uh, made their livelihoods through agriculture, much of it through ancient irrigation networks, uh, drier conditions looks like are the real cause. This is a research led by the University of Lincoln, UK, they reconstructed the effects of climate change on floodwater farming in the region and found decreasing river flow was equally, if not more important, for the abandonment of these previously flourishing city-states than the arrival of the Mongol horde. So climate change. Climate change. <laughs> Worse than the Mongol horde. <laughs> wow. I think that's the... Uh, that's the take the message there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it's an, it was a region that had been uh, pillaged and plundered and overtaken and changed governments and religions like many times previously. And then specifically, you know, the last one holding the bag was the Mongols and everything mm-hmm. went to silt. Uh, 
But apparently it's because the the climate change had taken place. Regional climate change had, had led to drier conditions and ruined the uh, flood irrigation. I don't know if it's still really irrigation if you're just flooding. I guess that's, <laughs> you know, whatever works. And then my last story tonight. Uh, hey, there's a challenge to dark matter being a thing that's important. Uh, this is a, a, an international group of scientists. This is from Case Western Reserve University Astronomy Chair Stacy McGall has published research contending that a rival idea to dark matter hypothesis more accurately predicts a galactic phenomenon that appears to defy classic rules of gravity. So, astrophysicists say because uh, uh, this is sig significant because it further establishes the hypothesis called modified Newton dynamics, aka MOND, or modified gravity, as a Worthwhile explanation for cosmological dilemma that galaxies appear to buck the long accepted rules of gravity traced to Sir Isaac Newton in the late 1600s. So, uh, according to this, uh, for decades we've measured more gravitational pull in space than we think should be there. There's not enough visible or known matter to account for all the gravity, thus the dark matter. Dark matter proponents uh, theorize that most of the un known universe is actually made up of a material that doesn't interact with light, making it invisible. So if we can't see it, it's not there, except we can see the effects, the gravity, so that matter must be there to account for those effects that we see in the gravitational pull amongst galaxies. And it's been, that's a popular thing that we talked about quite a bit on this show. Mond theory, counter explanation introduced by physicist Mordechai Milgram from Wiseman Institute, Israel, in the early 1980s, says this gravitational pull exists because the rules of gravity are slightly altered. <laughs> Instead of attributing the excess gravitational pull to an unseen, undetectable dark matter, Mond suggests that gravity at low accelerations is stronger than would be predicted by a pure Newtonian understanding. In addition, Mond makes a bold prediction. The internal motions of an object in the cosmos should not only depend on the mass of the object itself, but also the gravitational pull from all other masses in the universe. The external field effect is reaching out to everything. Which is sort of interesting because it's uh, starting to sound like what quantum is sort of doing when they're trying uh -huh. to describe uh, you know, every, like, bit of particles actually have to spread it out across the entire universe once you get small enough to see where it is. Uh, Milgram said the findings, if robustly confirmed, would be the smoking gun proving that galaxies are governed by modified dynamics rather than obeying the laws of Newton and of general relativity. So there was 150 galaxies in this test, which is a small sample size. <laughs> There are billions and billions and billions. But still, you know. Uh, Magan collaborators led by Kai Hain Che from Sejong University in South Korea say they detected this EFE in more than 150 galaxies studied. Now, now, right away I have a problem with this. They tested 150 galaxies. But then they detected this effect in more than 150. Is it like 150-ish? Right? Yeah. Like, how do you say that they, you can detect something in more things than you said you were going to detect? Because that's... Because then, I mean, because uh, what that leads you to say is like, but did you not detect it in any that weren't included in the study? It's so just sort of a six weird... Six out of five dentists recommend? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little problem there, but that's at least with this is. But this is just the blurb. This is that. This is not the study itself that I'm. I've, I'm looking at here. This is just the press release blurb. So there's some confusion yeah, it's that it's really 150-ish. There's some. It says they detected it in more than 150 galaxies studied. That's that's a problem. Just just if you wrote this as a press release, you should stop yourself and go. <laughs> 
why am I saying this? Or because why did they say that? it was 153, and that's more than 150. But it's, it, listen, but it's, they say, okay, they say they detected this EFE in more than 150 galaxies studied. Okay, fine. Their findings are published in the Astrophysical Journal. You can go look at it there. The external field effect is unique signature of MOND that does not occur in Newton-Einstein gravity, Maga says. This has no analogy in conventional theory with dark matter. Detection of this effect is a real head-scratcher. Team of six astrophysicists and astronomers includes lead author Che and other contributors from the United Kingdom, Italy, and United States. Uh, this is Che. Uh, I have been working under the hypothesis that dark matter exists. So this result really surprised me. Initially, I was reluctant to interpret our own results in favor of Mond, but now I cannot deny the fact that the results, as they stand clearly support Mond rather than dark matter hypothesis. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, the group analyzed... Hmm. Oh, group analyzed 153 rotational curves of disk galaxies as part of their studies. The galaxies were selected from the Spitzer Photometry and Accurate Rotation Curves Spark database created by another collaborator. Uh, in addition... Uh, they also had, this is University of Oxford was involved. This is Case Western. This is, I mean, this is a pretty a big group of people from big universities. This is not an outsider crackpot hypothesis, one-off physicist who's got this uh, interesting math that may not have been looked at yet. This, this is a pretty decent group uh, who are jumping in uh, to this study that's got this conclusion. Uh who is this one here? This is, oh, another researcher here. Uh, Lely, I don't know where they're from, but they say because the external field effect on rotation curves is expected to be very tiny, we spent months checking various systematics. In the end, it became clear we had a real solid detection. Yeah, so it's either a real solid detection that, uh, pushes dark matter out or maybe there's some combination or I, I mean this is this has been an ongoing debate for decades so it'll be really interesting to see how the astronomical community really uh, talks about this paper mm -hmm. and where this paper ends up going um, now that these results are out I find what I find interesting they've got when they're looking at the very very gravitationally uh, these 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 galaxies that are around a lot of other stuff and there's a lot of gravitational stuff going on they're like really detecting at high sigma value they're like yes this works the gravitational stuff and the average overall is four sigma according to their paper and i mean that's that's pretty good i mean four sigma it's no six sigma but four sigma. You no, know. four is better. The lower the number is the better, isn't it? No, the higher. Is it the higher? I thought it was. A, I thought it was one no. of those weird Six lower numbers. Good, no. I thought you wanted the least number of sigmas. Anyway, no. uh, this is a quote from uh, Maga here, who was, kind of sums up what you're sort of saying. I came from the same place as those in dark matter community. It hurts, hurts to think that we could be so wrong. And by hurts, it's not like pride. It hurts is, oh my gosh, we spend a lot of time. <laughs> but that's a lot what of science time. is. You have no, no, to do all it the is. things. You have to be you wrong. You have to yeah. do all the things. Yeah. You have to do it to find out you that have you're to wrong. lose a spider in the space station to understand. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it says uh, Milgram predicted this over 30 years ago with Mond. No other theory anticipated the observed behavior. Uh, Rod Haglin's comment from the chat on YouTube. <laughs> Not the first time Mond theorists have found a smoking gun. And this yeah. is very true. And we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about some of these stories through the years. So, um, yeah, I think I, I that's why I say the any one paper is not ever enough. And then it comes down to the conversation that happens within uh, within the community of scientists. Where do they take it? What studies happen on top of it? What additional analyses happen? Um, yeah, so this is by no means putting the nail in the coffin of dark matter. 
uh, but it is an interesting result for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Mond, the Mond theorists, they want it to be right. Dark matter theorists, they want that to be right. Everybody wants their ideas to be right. Nobody wants to be wrong. Unless, of course, it's finding the truth, right? So, Getting so the truth is. So ultimately, uh, what would be the most fun is for everyone to be wrong about the whole picture. Oh, yeah. But it's something each of them different. to be correct about the part. And then you yeah. have to just bridge the gap between the two to find out what's really going on. That, that which, would be fun. Which is a way that science has tackled a number of big issues in the past. Until you get to Einstein and he's just like, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> and then yeah. it stands for, you know, 115 yeah. years. <laughs> that can't be right, Einstein. No. Oh, 115 years later. I really hasn't been wrong about <laughs> well let me take you to some studies that are pretty cool not necessarily right or wrong but kind of awesome researchers publishing in the journal physical review letters have they've decided to talk about oh, making neuromorphic chips with magnetic material this is very very exciting this this paper of theirs. These researchers are at Hemholt Zentrum Dresden at Dresden Rossendorf, the HZDR. They've demonstrated a new approach to neuromorphic hardware. These are uh, chips that interface with neurons, right? Computers, the brain that you could put a computer together with a brain if you had chips that could work with the neurons and could connect, could connect and translate electronic signals or chemical signals back and forth. So far, it's all been run on traditional processors, but these researchers have a new approach. Tar targeted magnetic waves generated and divided in micron-sized wafers. Wafas. These little tiny wafas. Um, they are a disk of iron nickel it's just a few microns wide uh, there's a gold ring around the disc and then gigahertz alternating current gets flushed through it when it flows through microwaves get a, get emitted and then the disc elicits spin waves and the researchers say the electrons in the iron nickel exhibit a spin a sort of whirling on the spot rather than spinning rather like a spinning top they use magnetic impulses to throw the electron top slightly off course. And this is a disturbance that then gets passed on. Because if you can imagine a bunch of spinning tops and few of them get disturbed, they're going to bump into the things next to them and the things next to them. And so this disturbance will get transmitted through the material. And this is the spin wave getting transmitted like a wave through the material, and this can be used to transport information. So this group that's working on this chip discovered that the spin waves generated in this magnetic field uh, can be split into different waves, two different waves. And the researchers say so-called nonlinear effects are responsible for this. They are only activated when the irradiated microwave power crosses a certain threshold. And this is the point at which it becomes interesting because like neurons, when a threshold is crossed, that's when you can activate an action potential in a neuron. So this is really an interesting parallel to how real neurons work. And the researchers now are trying to determine how they can control these split spin waves and use them to uh, to basically create a neuromorphic chip that could act in a way that the brain works. Um, yeah, it could deal with situations. These neuromorphic computers could process more information, more brain-like. Um, and I said I said earlier these neuromorphic being able to communicate with a, with neurons. The other aspect is that set up in a system, a network, the 
neuromorphic chips all together in a network could act like a brain, more like a human brain, and process information um, in a very networked way and, and process large amounts of information at once, very much like a human brain. Yeah. That's frightening. Yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's a really fun, uh, fun advancement to be able to develop a technology that has these parallels to how the human brain works, because mm. as we try and create artificial technology, as we try to create technologies that require more processing power, multiple parallel streams and and crossover between those streams, intercommunications, very networked manner. Um, we know the human brain is an efficient design. And yeah, it could it could lead a lot of the computing designs of the future. Mm -hmm. Fancy fun times. Yeah, Skynet, here we come. But you know, that's the thing. There's the there's like you're almost saying we're going to take a very powerful we're going to create a very powerful genius into whose hands we're going to place that we don't know that's kicking the can down to the future some future despot or collection of well-meaning researchers will have access to this but we're going to create it anyway because mm -hmm. why not because science because science Science. It's one of the it's one of the few places where I'm like like the uh, we're talking earlier about all the faces uh, emoting similarly emotively. Mm -hmm. Boy, that can be misused with the <laughs> amount of facial recognition software that's available in despotic countries or in highly corporate uh, capitalistic societies. Either way. Yeah, I mean, taking that facial recognition technology, I mean, this is not neuromorphic chips, but if you've got neuromorphic chips running AIs that are doing the facial recognition and potentially c crowd control, and they're looking for people's emotions to determine whether or not people are ready to, to riot, or are they or, having a really good yeah. time, or, or, you or know, what is more the insidious, emotion? More insidious, more yeah. insidious, you, you uh, take a selfie with your phone, and it decides that, oh, you look a little sad today. You could use a purchase that makes a, a purchase comfort thing at the tune of about $300 if we pick the right item. Like this is, and then suddenly that's your ad. Like, hey, feel better with this new winter coat that's going to make you feel way, way more. Yeah. Or it's my, a new Google assistant, my Google assistant really wants to know me. I don't want my Google assistant to know me as what as much as it wants to. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Make my life easier. Or just I'm so easier. looking forward yeah. to, the, to, to the, as much as I am tied to technology constantly, there's going to be someday I'm just going to go straight John Savage, cut the cord, run to the wilderness, and just not come back. I'll just be done with all of you. I just won't come back. <laughs> he went to the forest, everyone. He will not be on. He's, he's gone to the land. <laughs> he will not be on the podcast again. Yeah, enjoy right, your well, Soma. I have took some with me. Just to, to ease my transition. <laughs> but until then. Oh. Well, one of the things about being human is that we have we, not just our facial emotions. We have this amazing sense of touch. And what is it? that allows us to have this sense of touch that we have. What is it? Nerves, brains. Nerves, uh, right, nerves and oh. brains, exactly. You've got our, our sensory mm -hmm. system that allows us. Oh, right, it. yeah, but we that's always... why I can't feel in my fingertips is because I, I got some nerves well, damaged. You got by a nerve. weasel. That, well, in your in your fingertips, bit. there are, there are bare nerve endings. There are, there are little nerve endings that <gasps> that 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 detect temperature there are are, are voltage gated channels that that help it detect acidity they are burning there is uh there are also these capsules the meissner corpuscles at the end of some of our sensory nerves 
that we know are involved in allowing us to feel very fine vibrations. And the very fine vibrations can help you determine the uh, the feeling of a, a small, of a slightly rough surface versus a very smooth surface, whether or not uh, something is actually vibrating beneath your fingers. Um, to be able to feel these things, we have very, very fine resolution thanks to our, our sense of touch. And the most interesting thing is that for years we've been like, yes, the Meissner corpuscles and the nerves, these are the things that allow us to touch and allow us to feel the touch. There we go. Thank you, nerves. Uh oh, I'm, t- I'm I'm sensing there's more to this story, <laughs> but it goes deeper. Yes, it's all because of a protein, not just the nerves, but a protein called Usher. Usherin. Usherin is essential for our sense of touch. It is located in these Meisner corpuscles. Researchers at UC, uh, not UC Berkeley. Nope, thank you. I was going to say the wrong thing, um, but. This team at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine, led by Gary Lewin, they did this study to figure out exactly what was at the core of our sense of touch using patients who have what's called Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome can affect uh, can affect multiple sensory uh, sensory systems, blindness, deafness, and the inability to sense vibration in the fingertips are some of the traits of people who have Usher syndrome. They recruited patients who have the specific kind of Usher syndrome that can't feel vibrations in their fingertips. And then they measured how well these patients versus controls were able to sense pain, temperature, and vibrations in their fingertips at 10 hertz and 125 hertz. And this is basically mimicking, like I said, touching a rough surface versus a slightly rough surface. And these patients did just great at feeling pain, at feeling the change in temperature, but they were four times less likely to pick up on those 125 hertz vibrations and Mm. one and a half times less likely to detect the 10 hertz vibrations. So then they were like, okay, something really is going on with Usher, with, with, with these Usher patients. Okay, we know that this is a mutation in the gene responsible for the protein Usherin. So they did the same study in mice that had this that had this gene that's called Ush2A or did not have the gene. They had mice that had had the Ush2A taken out. Rodents were great at the temperature and the change in uh, the the pain. Mm-hmm. Mice with Ush2A were better at detecting the vibrations than those without it. So this is really giving, pinpointing that Usherin is responsible for the sense of vibratory touch in the Meissner corpuscle. They found Usherin in and around the Meissner corpuscle when they went looking for it. Usherin's in all sorts of other places, but specifically they found it in this Meissner corpuscle. And so this is something that is new, newly understood. It gives a, a new nuance to how we understand our sense of touch and the fact that there's this this protein that's involved that yeah. that helps transmit the vibrations to our nerves in some way. So what I, other elements are involved that we don't know about? Yeah. So th- I might have like a lot of this. You know, you know, like when you get a cup of coffee and uh, uh, you put you the have sleeve ex- you on it. You think you have extra usher in? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, and you put, you put that sleeve on the cup of coffee so you can hold it. I still can't hold it. It's still too hot for my hand. I have to have them ice down the coffee. But it doesn't coffee. have anything to do with temperature. Usher okay, in so it's have just, to do the with just the vibration. So I got to find the yeah. temperature uh, thing. You're temperature so sensitive. You're just, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm super temperature set. Like I cannot, I have to wait till the thing cools to below room temperature. Otherwise, I feel like I'm burning my mouth, and I can't even hold. I'm like grabbing two of those and a napkin to carry my <laughs> cup of coffee out. No, it's real, like nobody else. I notice that no one else is having this problem around me, but I just can't even hold on to the thing because it's so hot. Anyway, 
Everyone but it's not the usher in. That's just a vibration sensor. I need. This might be some other protein. That's... Yes, usher in is usher in is going to be involved in uh, a lot of other systems, but specifically they have temperature was not one the, of them. Temperature was not one of them, but vibrations specifically, specifically vibrations in our sense of touch. So, so the really next is, time, really the next time you all run the way your, down. it's proteins all the way down. Yeah. The next time you rub your finger over a surface and can feel the roughness of a surface, uh -huh. say, thanks for ushering that in. Do you have a next story I can transition to real quickly? <laughs> uh, it is the, the end of the, end show, of right? the show. As we come to the end of the show, I do want to remind everyone that we will not be back next week for the podcast. We will, though. I think, are, are we decided? We, do we want to do a twist holiday party next Wednesday that I don't have to edit and turn sure. into a, a podcast? Yeah. So for yeah. anyone who's here live next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, we're going to have a live holiday party. It's the 23rd of December, is that correct? Yeah, 23rd oh, wow. of December. I'm going to bring Kai if if you know, this is this is a company party, so if you've got, you know, family, kids, we can we can bring our Christmas treats, bring your eggnog and um, mm -hmm. maybe maybe we'll sing some Christmas carols or I don't know, play deer pong. Something like that. Deer pong. It's like when you put cups on all the antlers of the deer, and then you try and bounce balls into the. <laughs> no. Never mind. Deer this pong. is that's that's just you, I think. No, I think I read about that in Doctor <laughs> Seuss. It's a gap. It's, uh, <laughs> if you have any back. questions, or if for for us, um, if you have any ideas for our top. 11 stories of 2020 which will be our last show of the year at the end of the month the last wednesday of december the 30th we will have our top 11 stories of 2020 if you have recommendations you can email me at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or you can leave us a message on our facebook page but i think that does it do you do you both have any any holiday messages before we say good night Merry Twistmas, everyone. And to all a good night. That's right. All right. Thank you all for joining us so much. We do hope that you enjoyed the show. There are some calendars left. So if you are interested in a calendar, head over to twist.org and click that horny frog to get yourself a calendar for 2021. Shout outs to Fada for helping with show notes and social media. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. And Identity4, thank you for recording the show once again. Really appreciate all your help. And very much thank you to our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you too. Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chef Stad, Hal Schneider, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Darwin Hannon, Donald E. Mundus, Sarah Stephen Alberon, Donald My Nope, Hoop, Lip, 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 Lurp, Daryl Myshack, <laughs> Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Bentley, the translator, Big Nell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Shauna, Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leisman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken, Z Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Rich Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brandon Minish, Melizond, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Richard Porter, Christopher Dryard, Mark Mazzaros, Ardeon, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Free Melania, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavis, Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Rothig, Gary S., Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Codron, Jason Roberts, and Dave Friedel. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click the Patreon button. That'll be, this'll be super easy. And on next week's show, 
We we're will just, be back. Yeah, we're just again. having a party. We're gonna have uh, a party. That's yeah. right. Is it? Are we still? Gonna, is it still the regular time? Wednesday, at eight p.m. Yes. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Wednesday, eight p.m. This is this is one not for the podcast audience. This is just for the live streaming YouTubering uh, type peoples who might happen to pop in eight uh, p.m. Pacific time or five a.m. Central European time, <laughs> as right. I may be. And again, so dear. that's right. Oh wait, no, not next week. That'll be not never mind. Next week. Never mind. Never yeah. mind. Um, yeah, but regardless, if you want to listen to us as a podcast when you do the real show, um, just search for This Week in Science or <laughs> podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. Four. <laughs> Mark, is that right? Wait, I lost place. Uh, we yes, four. no, that's correct. That's exactly four. right to me. Also, <laughs> we're having a day. It's a live show, ladies and gentlemen. It's a live show. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, we're doing this live. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available via our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter or buy a calendar while you're there. Or become a Patreon donor. It's all possible! Why are you yelling? <laughs> I know, I was about to whisper and I was like, it's going to make editing so hard. You can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten this week at science.com. Justin at twistminion at gmail.com or Blair, me at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into a pile of mond. Mond. You can also mongol us on Twitter where we are at twist science at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week for our fun holiday thing. Not here, here in two weeks. Uh, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Gunny eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got 
So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. We did it. We made it to the end of the show. We made it. We made it. We're at the end of the show. When everyone sings, we like to sing. We do like it. Oh, shoe bill costumes for humans, the most like life of lifelike of costumes, huh? <laughs> yeah, Justin's mic was too hot tonight, especially when yeah. he was yelling. I think he must It was have very hit. crackly. It, yeah. Uh, I didn't hear the yeah, it wasn't crackly. Just at the high just at the very high At points. the high end. Yeah. 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 I think I'm wondering if he hit the the little switch on the back of his microphone. Oh, yeah. There is one of them that's real hot. That's true. Yes. I'm wondering if that was hit. Where did was... Justin go? Mm. Wherever he goes when he decides it's time yeah. for him to take a break. I was going to wait for him to get back, but I I wanna know. I'm going to run away. <laughs> can we do next week as a Zoom video chat so we can see everybody and have them ask questions? Hmm. I don't know if we could do it as a Zoom video chat. That I mean, I guess we could do part of it as a Zoom. Hmm. Yes, we we covered the Ignoballs earlier this year, Gorov. Faux show we did. I always try to cover the Ignoballs because I think it's a very worthy worthy award. In, in it's uh, a couple of weeks before the Nobels. So I, I always try to cover both of them. Um, yeah, but we could potentially do Zoom. And if I was thinking also, there's this there's this cool platform called AirMeet that I like. And I think we can stream to YouTube from AirMeet. Mm. And um, AirMeet allows people to like sit at tables together and have conversations and you can like go from table to table to table and talk to talk to different people yeah that's one idea yeah there's also jitsi very similar yep i see you i see you saying matrix thunder beaver yeah so i don't know i mean i don't know that i want a completely open Zoom call where everybody can join because as much as I love that, that just opens up possibility of uh, uh, Zoom bombing, which I'm not a fan of. Right. Mm. Yes. What if? One what if we bear. just? I think we need this announcement for all of them. <laughs> um. What if we just? Uh, Gouchy gamer. Send it out to our Patreon patrons. Mm-hmm. I could send it out to our Patreon patient patrons. That's a great idea. And then whatever we do, we can usually stream from Zoom to YouTube. There, that is possible. Mm. Tis possible. So, am I gonna have to actually think about this before Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to think? I'm trying not to think next week. That's my plan. I want well, to do no, very no uh, yeah. research. I suppose research won't. No, happen, no show. But... No, no, no. Yeah, I can yeah. set up a. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not a fan mm-hmm. of Zoom though. Zoom is. I know, Carol. The whole point's to make it hassle-free, exactly, and fun. Just fun. I'm not a fan. The reason I'm not a fan of Zooms is that everybody ends up on a screen together, and it's just like, ah, and it's super overwhelming. Right. Um. Yeah. So. I don't like all the people on one screen at the same time, which is why I'm thinking air meat could potentially be something that we could. What are we uh, contemplating? Is this for next week or is this for mm-hmm. something yeah. else? Oh. Yes. A way for us to have a party. I don't know. Or we'll just come here and do the show without yeah. the show. We'll just have a party here like we do. It sounds and... That sounds reasonable. Yeah. yeah, I'll think about it. Fine. I'll think about it. And if there I'll is a mix sign some up, drinks. And... Oh, Stephen Rain. Yes, I yeah, I can do that too. <laughs> uh, we could also do a thing where we like interact with the chat room live. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, totally. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, we can do something. Oh, Thunder Beaver can host and password protect things. We like servers. We could do something. I don't know what Matrix is. We've talked about it before. Oh, look at me yawning. Oh, my goodness. It's 10 o'clock at night. So, I'm standing again. I made a standing desk tonight, and I'm like, this is way better than sitting in the chair. I'm st- yeah. yeah. I'm still yeah. trying to Standing's figure out how to better. set up a lying down desk. <laughs> <laughs> Every desk is a lying down desk to you, Justice. <laughs> Which I had, I had during our... Uh, yeah, Tristan again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, AirMe, you don't have to download anything. It's browser based. It's no it's it's easy. It's browser based. You don't have to download anything, Carol Ann. It's pretty cool. It's kinda cool. It's kinda cool. Um It's the holidays almost. We'll get this podcast out. Blair's already on holiday. Yes. I'm I'm in fact I'm gonna run away in a moment. Let's see. What night is it? It's Night seven. Seven? Night yeah. seven, yes. So you have five more nights of Hanukkah? Is that no. is it, one? Is it 12? Oh, no. eight. Eight. <laughs> no, it's the 12 days of Christmas. Yes. <laughs> the eight days of Hanukkah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I always try and go back to the lyrics of the Adam Sandler song. Yeah. About eight Hanukkah. crazy nights and eight crazy nights. I have to go through the lyrics before I can get to the number, though. <laughs> yeah. Yes, quiz time. Mm. Yes, score of like the sh- the trivia idea. I like okay. the trivia idea okay. too. I can, I can roll out fun. some trivia for next week. So Absolutely. I um I already made some holiday trivia. I made a holiday trivia deck for work that I can just use. Also, if you guys want to okay. do that? It's already done. <laughs> So zero yeah. work is the beauty there. I like I like that. Yeah, I think that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. let's make it a trivia. questions is work. Yeah, bring yeah. that. Bring your trivia deck. Done. Double duty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Do you still have Mailchimp? Uh, yes. Because I know you had it because of the zoo, but I, so I was wondering if you still had it. Oh, no, that was a separate account. Oh, cool. Okay, good. You're I made a, a separate s- account for us. So She just automatically associated it with the zoo because of the chimp factor? Yes. 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 Right. Um, yeah, no, I can, um, I can definitely populate the bones of a newsletter this weekend. That's, that's easy. Yeah. I have, I have things when I get also. home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no push, but this, yeah, I think it would be good to send one out for the holiday. Yeah. For the end of the year. Yeah. Um, You're going to quiz us? You can yeah. quiz us next week. Great. Yes. We'll be, uh, are we, oh, yes, yeah. next, next week, wherever test, we test are. Test the knowledge. I don't know, that could be dangerous. Test the actual knowledge of the, the hosts of their favorite science show. Yeah, you might learn more than you didn't want to know about the integrity. <laughs> Apparently, of the Blair knows a lot about warp drive. Apparently, yeah. she knows I the mean, canon. I just, I just saw the episode. Is the thing. <laughs> so I, 
It's, when I watched Voyager when it was first on TV, that episode was the only episode that I remembered at all. It, because it was so gross. Because Tom Paris was like flaking and lost his tongue and stuff. But then uh, re-watching it, yes. So basically, <sighs> here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brian because he's sitting right here. So basically, right, it's because Warp 10, they're simultaneously at all points in the universe. Yes. yes. Okay, so why did that turn him into a salamander? <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, they, in, the, in the episode, they're saying that, that is, that's... that's evolving them oh it, it evolved them more it didn't devolve them salamanders are more so highly it was, evolved it was is still that what in they... the dna it was just no, randomizing the expression of dna within the biological oh, yes. host sure yes yes so then he turns into a salamander and then he kidnaps janeway and she, it takes her to warp 10 so that she also turns into a salamander so they can make salamander babies on a class M planet. So that's that's warp 10, turns out. So <laughs> Yes. I don't I yeah, okay. Salamander. So anyway, babies. on that note, it's I'm gonna all go all axolotl from here. <laughs> Have a wonderful mini holiday getaway, Blair. Thank you. Thanks. Justin. And I'll see you guys next week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and before anybody leave, leaves, uh, I want to talk to you in the after the after show really briefly. The after the after show. Yeah. Got it. Just for a second. Okay. Sec. Okay. So, okay. Are we going to, we're going to, we're going to call it an early night oh, tonight. Early Say night. goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good, Good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful week. We hope that you'll join us for our holiday party next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Stay safe. Take care. We'll see you soon. <laughs>